live from the Washington, D.C. area. It's the Inside Scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Good evening. I'm your host, Katherine Reed. Thank you for joining us on Inside Scoop Virginia. We have a wonderful lineup for you today. We're going to be talking about the future of women in politics. And I have got some amazing women here to talk about what we're going to do, how we're going to do it. And um, joining me on our first segment is Katherine Hanley, known to many as Kate, Kate. Hanley. Um, she has been a player for a long time in Northern Virginia, in Fairfax County, and in the Commonwealth, having served as the chair of the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors and also as the secretary of the Commonwealth. Thank you so much, Kate, for joining us. I'm glad to be here. Now, in your current role, you yes. are the chair of Emerge Virginia. Yes, I am. Which is why we are here tonight. And that's why I'm here tonight. <laughs> so you are going to educate us just a little I bit am. about how Emerge came here, the larger, there's a larger organization, right. and what we are doing. Well, Emerge Virginia is part of a national, or it's an affiliate of a national organization essentially called Emerge America. And the purpose of Emerge is to train women to run for office, Democratic women to run for office. Um, in Virginia, I guess, we have now 17% of our General Assembly is female. Um, the Federal Congress is not much better. I think the House of Representatives, 19%. Um, and it's not getting better. And part of the reason it's not getting better is we really don't have a bench. So part of what Emerge Virginia does is works to train women to run for office at every level. Um, school board, soil and water district, um, house of delegates, members of your local council or your local board of supervisors, and Congress, hopefully, and then president. But we need a bench, and so that's what we're interested so in doing. So is this your third election cycle? What was, what was your first class? Our first class was in 2014, and then we did a boot camp. For, we have t sort of two programs. The, main pro the major program, the one that's familiar to everyone nationwide, is a seven-month program that talks about um, how you run for office from soup to nuts. Um, and this is very focused on not just today, but the long term, that you might be interested in running in three to five years or 10 years, and what you need to do and how you need to be involved in the community and take an interest or, and, and work on something that you are an expert in, relatively. Um, and then we did a boot camp in 2014 because we had people on the ballot this year um, that already knew they were going to be on the ballot and we couldn't, they couldn't do it in the spring. We do that in the spring. They, we couldn't do that at the same time they were running for office. And so we had, then that focused on more short term, more immediate, you know, message, media, um, uh, consultants, how you get on the ballot all those kinds of very, that we do in the long term, but very focused on the actual And you have these race. candidates from all over the state. This yes. is not a Northern Virginia no. thing, it's not? No ma'am, it's statewide. Um, we had 14 of our graduates on the ballot this year, five of them won. Um, you're gonna talk to Amy Lawfer, who is a school board member, and she won again. Um, and Jennifer Boisco later, late, will be right. on later, she won. Um, so we are very proud of those. Um, it's, it's really important that we, that we help people run for office because the rules are different for women. And there is an application process. Oh, so there is. So let's talk about what, for people who are our viewers, saying, well, this might be for me, how does one go about? Well, we've just, we've just closed the application process for, we do it January through July on Saturdays, um, the, long, the long form. Um, and you apply online and then uh, the class ends up being somewhere between about 20 and 25. Um, and we meet all over the state. We don't just meet Northern Virginia, we move around the state because we do hope to have people from uh, across the state. Uh, and it's, um, it's interesting to see how the class bonds. I, I would not have thought that would have been such an important part, but it's a very important part. It, it so is. So that people I, I are run in into this them. together. I run into them, and I, I took a wonderful picture of Tammy Lambert and uh, Atima Omara. Yes, you did. At the Sorensen. I, I, yes, we, and they, they gravitate in a room full yeah. of women. The cohort tends to gravitate it, it toward does. one another. And, and it's been a tremendous support for them, their decision making, um, all just emotional support, and that's particularly important. But it's also particularly important for that people know what it, what it entails. It, it's, um, we're not gonna, 
any given year, there are only about 25% of the people on the ballot are women. Yes. That's almost any year. Um, so it's a, we don't ha have a lot of people who have experience in that who can say, oh yeah, that happens. Um, don't worry about it. Or here's what's going to happen. Uh, think about this in advance. Uh, so it's important to have that kind of support. As far as um, the cost of, so you have the application process and there is a cost. Mm -hmm. Of course, you are a nonprofit. And oh, so you raise money. We're all those things, yes. But you also have a fee that is paid by the student who can also fundraise that fee because yes. I know there have been people yes. who've applied and been accepted and they're like, well, I can't write a check, but I can raise the money, which in and of itself is a great skill. And that's one of the things we spend a whole Saturday doing is, is teaching people to, that the worst anybody can say is no and how to make the ask and how to call and, or talk to folks and raise money. But yes, you're right, we do provide scholarships for those that, that have difficulty writing that check. Um, it's, it's so important that people learn all the aspects of what's, what's about to happen, and raising money is one of those it's, important it's things. It's very key, but that, there's also a limit, too. We're going to have Amy Laufer on, who's yes. one of your alumnus, yes, she who is. started Women Leaders of Virginia as a PAC, which is a political action committee that raises money. I think people get confused. Absolutely. We are not a PAC. Um, Emerge Virginia does not endorse women. We don't contribute to women. The money we raise goes to the program and staffing the program and, and, and doing the educating. But we are not a PAC. Because, and if you think about it, if we've trained a lot of women out there, they might be running against each other. And that's, that's true. That's okay, would, too. That would be great to actually it think that would. could happen in the future, that we have all these women who are and, running and yes, the same time. And so, so we do not. Um, give away any of the money we raise. We use it uh, for the training and the program. That's fantastic. So as, as you go out into the state and you bring the women into the program, you've just explained that you do it on Saturdays, different parts of the state, so people mm -hmm. get an experience. Mm -hmm. How about your instructors? What kinds of people come in oh. and exactly how do we beef up the... Uh, well, the, we have somebody from Emerge America that comes and does the opening session of, of what we're about to do and, and how to get started and the group experience in the opening. But we've been very lucky because we have such wonderful uh, people who work for um, here in this area and in Virginia who work for consulting firms and mail programs and press people and all kinds of folks come in and teach us. Um, you even came and taught us about social media at one I point, did. which is very important and something we've got to think about. So we have a lot of people who know what they're talking about and have that experience and they come and talk about it. And we've been very lucky to have some really terrific people. Yeah, and I know that, too, that you have been very supportive. Speaking of social media, Emerge Virginia has a Facebook page. Yes, it does. And throughout the election, I saw how you called out the candidates, you supported them, not in any specific way no. through money or endorsement, but simply showcased the fact that they were graduates of your program, basically saying these women are graduates of our program. The other thing that I always tell them is, you know, even if it's the middle of the night and you come home from some joint appearance or some debate and something has just happened that you're sure is the end of the world or conversely you're sure it's the most fabulous thing that's happened and you've got to talk to somebody about it i encourage them to call me if they have if they need to know something at you know it doesn't matter how late at night i've spent a lifetime in politics with people calling me it's too late to call after one and too early to call before six but any other time you can get me to talk about those things when they happen because there's not that much new that happens um, sometimes it's fairly appalling but it, it, it's new but it's that kind of support that says okay and here's maybe what you can do about it or no that's happened and it, it it's kind of standard. So from your personal experience, having yeah. been a candidate and having run a lot of campaigns and elections and working with groups of women who are running, yes. do women tend to internalize some of these yes. things a little bit more? The rules are different for women. Men are smart in the newspaper or intelligent. Women are bright. Like I, a penny. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, dress matters. You never write, see an article written about somebody's blue blazer but you'll see an article. You'll see an article about how they dress or how their hair's cut or all those things. Should that be the case? No, but it is. And um, 
So various, there are various different standards. As I say, women have to be both likable and knowledgeable. Men can be either to be successful. There's polling data on that. So the rules are different. I, somebody will call, if you have small children, will call you out in a group and say, who's going to take care of your children while you're in Richmond, for example. Um, you Obviously, you thought of that, and so you're going to have to have that answer. Um, but the rules are just a little bit different still, and so people need to be prepared for that. The other thing uh, that's always annoyed me is the assumption that women are going to be um, only interested in women's issues. And I have this feeling that all of the issues are women's issues, but the one that's really annoyed in me over the years is, well, you're probably not very interested in public safety because that's not a woman's issue. And yet, it's the women of the Commonwealth and the country that are most concerned about safety in Absolutely. many ways. And so I've always wondered, why isn't that the number one woman's issue? So sometimes you get defined into a box that you have to be sure that you don't let yourself get defined into. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I think uh, in the race with Jill McCabe and Dick Black, the fact that she was relegated to doctor and mother, his yes. list was very, very long and hers was very short, as if the two things that were listed there were inconsequential. True, and, but sometimes, and often you need to start with experience or knowledge to keep from being put in that box. Um, you, gotta, you gotta know your budgets. Um, you have to know the local issues. I mean, you cer certainly have to know your districts. I'm glad you mentioned that because that's one of the reasons that we focus on process and not specifically on teaching you about issues uh, because you need to know the local issues. Tip O'Neill was right, all politics is, is local. local. And local issues are going to be different in different parts of the state. We encourage you to be involved in the community um, we've had, the governor has appointed a number of our graduates to boards and commissions, and we encourage that um, to, to be familiar with the issues, to pick the one that's, that you care about and, and, and know something about that and be a leader in the community in that way. But Virginia is a big state, and so things are different in different communities. Um, so we, we encourage you to be involved in your local community. Of course, I'm at heart a local official, and I think that's where the action is. So I always want people to know what's going on in their, in their hometowns. Well, so far it has worked for you. I think it's working for a lot of the women in your program. Uh, when we return, we're okay. going to dig a little deeper into okay. the process that you just referred to. We'll talk about some of the candidates okay. um, who've been through your program and also what you expect in 2016. So join us after the break, and we'll be back to talk to Kate Hanley. Listen to smoke before you give it a try. Only you. Don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Only you can prevent wildfires. Fire. Why don't you just wash your car at home? When I wash my car, everything runs down the street and down into the storm drains. With all the chemicals and the soaps and waxes, the last thing I want to do is poison my own drinking water. At least here, it's all contained and recycled on site. That's why I also take my car in for oil changes instead of doing it myself. I might take a chance on spilling stuff. You know what the best part is? What? More time to kick back and watch the game. How far would you go to protect the planet? I want you to build an ark. Maybe there's another way. People, the flood is imminent. Is it too much to ask for a little precipitation? Go to fightglobalwarming.com to find out what you and your community can do to reduce global warming pollution. Somewhere around the world, there are men and women of the armed forces risking their lives, helping rebuild communities after natural disasters, collecting toys for needy children, tutoring kids in school. These are your sons and daughters who work to keep us safe, secure, and free. Dedicated men and women who put their country first.
Catherine Reed, I'm your host for Inside Scoop Virginia. Joining me tonight is Kate Hanley, who is the chair of Emerge Virginia, which is a program part of Emerge America, which is the national uh, program that trains women candidates to run for office, Democratic women candidates to run for office. Yes, Thank you so much, Kate. I'm glad to be here. So when we uh, went to our break, we were talking a little bit about how women um, frame issues, find an issue. Let's talk about how we find women to run. How do we find women to run? Well, that's a really interesting question because there are studies that know that when the community or the party is looking for women to run or the community is looking for people to run, you can, women don't know they're being asked to run. You can ask them three or four times and they'll still say, oh, I, me? And it's very different for a male. You say, um, boy, you did that well. And he said, they'll say, yeah, I'll run. So it's, it's, the recruiting is a little harder. Women don't naturally think about running for office. There's not a tradition of that. Um, I tell a story about my daughter when she was first year at UVA. She had a bumper sticker on her car that said Hanley for supervisor. That was back when I was um, the Providence supervisor. And uh, a young man said, oh, your dad's in politics. And she said, no, it's my mother. And he said, I don't know anybody whose mother's in politics. So that sort of sums it up. That was a while back. She's no longer, she's out for a while, but it's still some of that. So we, um, we recruit in ways that we talk to people who in, around the state who know people that are interested and we let them know that this program is there and we'd like to help if they'd like to be helped. Um, but it does take some, some looking around at the grassroots because this is really what we're about at the grassroots to start there. Um, it's really an interesting difference of, of trying to get women comfortable. And so when we start in the program, because uh, running for office is a contact sport nowadays. It is. It it's, is, it it is yeah. long, it is intense, it is expensive. And you pretty much put a lot of things on hold to do it. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Um, and, and you have to be sure that your family's on board with it. Um, the same daughter had done a lot of politics in her lifetime uh, before she was out of college. Uh, but it's really interesting to get uh, to, to see the class as it comes together. And uh, people discover they really can do this. Sometimes our class members say, you know, I think I really would like to be involved at, a manag at, at managing campaigns. And we don't have, oh, well, that's so few women not campaign the focus managers. of so our, few. it's not the focus of our program, but there are very few. And, and so that's helpful too, uh, to get people to understand, get women to understand that that's something also important to do. And we've had a couple of folks um, do that. Um, so it's, it's across the gamut of being involved in politics and that you can do this. And of course, I think it's fun. I not only think it's fun, I think it's important to do. So do you think momentum, so you're, you're starting 2016 will be your third year of doing this. Our, well, it'll be our second full, our third full class. Right. But we have, a, the, we boot have the boot camp in between. Do you think momentum's going to build as more people meet Emerge graduates, more Emerge graduates run, as more people understand what the program is, who's completed the program? And as you said, you've got five wins out of 14 alumni who ran this year. Um, can we look forward to a time where there will simply be a momentum that carries forward from, from this program? I hope so. I hope so for people that it's been demystified. Um, for example, Dahlia Palchek, who won uh, a school board uh, race here in Northern Virginia in Providence District, is one of our graduates. The other thing that I would say for our listeners who are here in Northern Virginia, many of them, um, we're used to women in politics. That's true. The rest of the state doesn't so quite have that familiarity. Um, not nearly as much. I remember knocking on a door many years ago and the sign said Hanley. The, the, that's all they said, Hanley for whatever it was, supervisor, I guess, Hanley for supervisor. And I knocked on a door and a lady said, oh, you're a woman. <laughs> And I said, yes, is that a bad thing? And she said, no, it's a good thing. So the rest of all, the next five times, I'll say Kate Hanley. Ah. Um, so there are the tricks like if you have a name that could be a male or a female, you see pictures of women. Because right. in Northern Virginia, it is not a disadvantage. It is often an advantage. The rules are different if you know the difference, uh, the rules. 
the unwritten rules, but it's often an advantage. The rest of the state is not quite there, ha hasn't had that Kim, Kim Atkins was one of your alumni. Yes, she was. And, and ran a great campaign. She did. But in a red district with an, against an incumbent. And running against an incumbent is always a challenge. She ran a terrific campaign. She'd been mayor. Yes, yeah, I know, I'm, twice. I'm back, I'm back to that local experience thing yeah. again. So um, that's why we're you know, looking at school board and mayors and council members and boards of supervisors members, all those things that, of course, again, I believe are really the most important, but are give you a basis for continuing. You know, it's interesting. I was down at, uh, Mark Warner does a women's conference every year mm -hmm. and moves it around the state, and it was in Roanoke this past Saturday, mm -hmm. and there were over 600 women there. I mean, wow. they were at capacity. It far exceeded their expectations. But what astonished me the most was the diversity of women. I mean, of every age. I mean, millennials that were there, women who've been doing it for 60 years. There were Latinas there and African American. I mean, every, I mean, I've never seen probably so much diversity of that many women in one place. And I was struck by the fact that it was everybody. Everybody was there. And the breakout sessions were very interesting. One of them was called Women as Agents of Change. And what was interesting about that is that women are interested in how you are an agent of change. They don't know how. I, I don't. I think women showed up to that conference on a Saturday all day long because they think they can make. A, I think they believe they can make a difference. I don't think they know how. And and that's <clears throat> that's part of what we have going here for us. We also have been uh, very successful in having people in our class from all backgrounds. Um, um, it's a, been a multicultural experience. We've been very successful with that. Um, and. The good news about that is that everybody sees that we're all in this together. And uh, the face of Virginia is changing, and our elected officials need to change as well. And so it's important that we do that outreach into all the various communities, uh, not only geographically, but ethnically, um, and have all that diversity. Age-wise, I am. Um, well, I've aged out, but I think it's important to get younger women involved. I do too. Because um, so many of us have been doing this for so long, I'm told that, that we baby boomers, and I'm even a pre-baby boomer, <laughs> held on so long that we've kept the next generation, the, I don't know, the Gen Xers? Gen Xers, uh, yeah. That we've kept them out. <clears throat> we need to have those Gen Xers in now. So I'm apologizing publicly for having done that. Listen, I, Come on, I, think, I think that was a, a <laughs> great for you to recognize that. I call Gen X the Prince Charles generation. Yes. His well, mother has hung <laughs> on, and they want Prince William to take the throne, and poor Charles has waited his whole life. And he is Gen X. Yes. You know, barking at his heels is his son, and blocking yeah. the path is his mother. So I understand that there's a, gener a generation that That's is waiting, just, that is waiting yes. for an opportunity. And now because we've had in the last eight years so uh, a lot of involvement in, ver in the, really the millennials and the young millennials, we don't have that, that middle, I hate to call them middle age, <laughs> that middle group Right. Of, of people coming along, we really need those women to be involved now. I agree with you, and I think a part of that too is giving them the resources, the confidence, and a path. You know, that we keep talking about with young girls, recognizing the fact that we've got to do more in elementary school and middle school and high school to move them forward on different paths. But, but time and again I hear you can't be what you can't see. As you True. said, women don't look around and see women in elected office or women in leadership positions or in the boardroom or as the head, at the head of organizations. How can we aspire to be something that we have no experience of? One time, many years ago, I was talking to a group of Girl Scouts, and they were sitting in a living room, um, and they were listening to me talk about Fairfax County and the map and all the things I do and, and what it, things were interesting, you know, how we affected their lives, how county government affected their lives. And there was this little girl sitting on the floor, backed up against the sofa, and she looked at me after I thought <clears throat> I'd been brilliant. Uh, and she said, Mrs. Hanley, do you have to know anything to be on the Board of Supervisors? <laughs> and I've never forgotten that because I said, well, if you mean is there a test, well, yes, it's every four years at the polls. But yes, you do have to know something. <laughs> I thought I was, had explained sewers and roads right. and all that stuff, taxes. Um, 
but you do have to know something. And when you're at, as a woman running for office, you really do have to think about what you're going to say, think about how you're going to say it, make it clear, and know something. She was, she was asking a good question. I never was quite that vague again. There you go. But and and do you believe that women tend to to get into an election or a campaign or to run for office because they want to do something rather than to just be the elected? I have seen that. I don't know yes. if that's been your well, experience. Well, I don't that know. That's interesting. That women want to do something or are more issue focused than simply saying I want to be delegate or I want well, to be senator. Well, I came to it out of public education. Um, my father was the executive director of the Missouri State Teachers Association. I'm an old, 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 old retired school teacher. And I came to it out of my belief in public education and the importance that it has for our future, not only individually for our young people, but collectively. And um, so public education was what got me to apply for the school board because I was on the Fairfax School Board when it was appointed. Um, and then to run for office and, and public education started to be my focus. One of the things you discover in office, however, is that you, you can't focus on just one thing. There is a big difference between running for office and governing. Some people are much better at running for office and not so good at governing, and some people are really good at governing and really not good at running for office because they don't like to, well, they don't like to raise money, but, they, but it's, it's, it's quite a schedule. And you have to, and you have to boil down what you know um, to, to sound bites. Uh, what, one of the things that I tell women when they're running for office is if you get your substance right, the politics will take care of it itself because you'll know what you're talking about. That applies, I think, po probably to both sexes, but I'm working with women here. Uh, and, and you know, I think there is a certain raised expectations for women to have to prove it more. That men are given a certain amount because they seem to look the part or wear it, or but women really do have to prove that they have the knowledge and the substance and the wherewithal, the stamina, to actually do the job. Stamina is an important part. It, you, you're, it's going to be, if you think that you're going to do it part time, there's no such thing. The other thing that, um, that happens is women, are, I think, are more affected by the effect of, on their children. Um, and there is, there's sometimes a really dreadful effect. You need to inoculate your children and say, now you're going to hear perfectly awful things about your mother. Um, you know me, don't listen to them, forget it. Or don't you ever get into a fight over your mother, let me take care of myself. Those are the kinds of things that you have to think about going in because the family dynamic changes. And well, thank you so really much, Kate. I think you have given our viewers terrific. Lots to think about. Lots to think about, but encouragement yes. for everyone to, to know that they can do it. You can do this. So after the break, we'll join me again and we'll be talking to Amy Laufer. Saving for retirement might be easy for some folks, but for others, it might take a little more work. And for those who haven't started, there are still things you can do to catch up. Oh, that is good news. Like getting out from underneath past debt. And don't get wrapped up with high interest credit cards. Let's get you some eyes. Be diversified with your investments. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Your financial goals are not out of reach. The choice is clear. For a happy ending, choose to save. Everyone with alcohol and drug addiction is in the same boat. With treatment, you can find solid ground. For drug and alcohol information and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Dude, are you sure you want this tattoo? Because, just do it! Some mistakes in life are permanent. Like hearing loss. To learn how to protect your hearing, visit ASHA.org. You've probably heard about heart disease, but did you know that it's the number one killer of women nationwide? Heart disease claims more lives each year than breast cancer, lung cancer, or strokes combined. But there are steps you can take to protect yourself against it. 
For more information on how you can prevent heart disease, contact your local American Heart Association or visit their website at www.americanheart.org. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back. I'm Katherine Reed, your host for Inside Scoop Virginia. Joining us in the second half of the show is Amy Laufer. Amy is a member of the Charlottesville School Board who is an alumna of the Emerge Virginia program we just spoke with Kate Hanley about. She has run successfully for office twice. And she is also the founder of Women Leaders of Virginia PAC, PAC being a political action committee. That is a committee that raises money, endorses candidates, and gives money away to fund campaigns. So thank you so much, Amy, for joining us this evening. Thank you, Catherine. I met you, I guess, for the first time earlier this year, and just, right. it was cosmic, it was electric. Um, I was <laughs> like, oh my gosh, this woman is getting things done. And I have been impressed thank you. Thank you. from day one about the fact that you said this is an unmet need, you have a very big vision for why this is critically important to get getting women into office, and, and what you intend to do about it, what you have done. You are a doer sort of person. Well, thank you very much. Actually, before I talk about the PAC, I do want to say how I got into politics, because I think it's a very common story, especially for women. So about five years ago, a friend of mine calls me and says, you know, you should run for school board. There's going to be an opening soon. And my immediate thought was, I am not qualified, even though I have a master's in education from Columbia University. I was a middle school math and science teacher, and I had three children in the school division. And yet, I still, my immediate reaction that was, was that. was your first reaction is you're not qualified. <laughs> right, so I think that is, many women feel that way, and I want them to know they are qualified. If I was not qualified to be on the school board, who could have been? So, um, you know, your qualifications are the qualifications for elected office, and you should go for it. And I did, and I was successful, and I'm actually the chair of the school board now. So I was vice chair for two years, chair this year. So um, it's been a great time. I enjoy collaborating and talking about school issues. But after my third year on the board, someone asked me to do the Emerge Virginia Boot Camp training. And I thought, well, it is for candidates running for office. They have to be declared, which I had already declared to run for school board again. And I thought it would be a great opportunity to hear about how to run a campaign in a different way. So I went for the weekend, and it was great training. We heard about image consulting, um, trying to go through the van, talking about the voters, fundraising. Uh, but through this weekend, I, made, I met eight women that were running for state office. And through my work as a school board, I had been lobbying in Richmond, and I had not met that many women as actual delegates. So I was very excited to see women actually attempting to get elected to state office. And I felt compelled after that weekend to start a PAC because I know one of the major barriers for women is fundraising. And I think having a dedicated PAC for Democratic women will help them succeed you know, statewide. So that was my impetus. And this year we had our first year. Um, I did several events, including you. Yeah, that's where I met you, I guess, was the March event <laughs> yes. in Charlottesville. Yes, we had a kickoff event. We had uh, almost a dozen candidates come and speak to constituents and tell them why they were running. And it was, an, it was amazing. It was an amazing crowd. It was electric. It was really exciting. We raised $10,000 that night, and so we just kept going. And my goal for the organization is that we will have representatives across the state. I would love to raise $500,000, have 8,000 supporters. I think um, many states do this, and we, we need to do this for our women. I, well, you know the statistics. We're 43rd in the country in terms of women elected to state office. Yes. Uh, we've never had a woman governor, and we've never had a woman senator, and we need to build the bench. The bench is the state office, and I know Kate was talking about other elected officials, and it's true, down the ballot, city council, supervisor, school board, we need more women on every level running. So that's my goal. Yeah, and they, because they become move-up candidates. Exactly. But getting, but getting to the point where this PAC has credibility like Annie's List in Texas or Lillian's sure. List in North Carolina. 
Some, I think Lillian's List started in 1997? Yes, actually, so I have been in contact with those PACs and asked them kind of the do's and don'ts. And it, it takes a long time to actually get the tipping point where you start getting 8,000 members. It's about a five to 10 year horizon. But you know they've been successful in supporting at least two women each year to get elected. This year we've supported actually five of the women that were elected. Uh, three were new, two were incumbents. And you know we just need to keep moving the needle. You know these things will not change if we don't do something about it. Now I know that there was a meeting after the election was over down in Charlottesville where you got some feedback from some of the candidates. I mean it's always after an election there's a period of time where people say what could we have done better? What what didn't we do or what could have been done that might have affected the outcome? What were some of the things you were hearing? So I don't know if Kate had mentioned, but there were more women running this year than ever before and most of them had actually gone through the eMERGE training and some of the women, well actually most of the women that went through eMERGE training got at least 40% of the vote, which is really an incredible amount. Now, Candy Hilliard got 40% against the Speaker of the House. Exactly. I mean, this is monumental. It truly is. And within the, the women that ran, we raised $3.9 million and got 100, or 170,000 votes. I mean, this, this is monumental. Mm -hmm. So through this, uh, we met a week after the election, and we had almost every, I, we had over a dozen women there. And I think there's one thing that really came through was that the Democratic committees in each of the counties and cities really have to understand their commitment to a, cam a campaign. It is helping to fundraise. It is helping with the uh, ground game. And how can we help these committees support these candidates? I mean, there is a level of that. Um, we also heard just, you know, they needed more funds. We had at least three women that could have really used another 100,000. Jill McCabe, who you uh, yes. mentioned, you know, so Shelley Simons, the list goes on. So um, definitely a PAC could be helping these women to get their message out, you know, hire the right campaign staff, get in front of media and more voters. But, and this has got to be a collaborative effort too. So the one thing we haven't brought up is the, the caucus. You know, the Democratic caucus in the House and the Senate also raise money to give to candidates who are running for office. I am pleased to announce that I just found out today that Delegate Kathleen Murphy is now the finance chair for the Democratic caucus in the House. Go Kathleen. Yes. And I think you are going to see a change in, not necessarily a change so much as a stepping up uh, and a laser focus on not just raising more money, but choosing what campaigns to support because the methodology being used to select which candidates should get money, and that's not just the caucus, that is all kinds of organizations determining who is a viable candidate. All of us have to kind of work together and I, there's probably a, a better way. I, what is your thought as far as how they choose what races to support? Actually, I think their method is, you know, democratic leaning counties and cities, which makes sense. But I also think that the ground game has to be stronger. My um, kind of encouragement to the women that just ran was, you had 40% of people just voted for you. Keep in contact with them. Get out there and do teas, do lunches, invite them in, talk about what you're working on, stay involved in the, commu the community, um, and ask them to bring five more people. And in the next two years, try to build your base in that way. Um, as far as the caucus, I know Jennifer is going to be talking about that. I'm glad to hear that they are separating out some of these responsibilities because we need to do that. One person cannot be responsible for d all the fundraising, determining who gets the money. It, it was too much. So I think, I think it'll be more effective. You're more effective when you have more people. That's just I think that's true. And of the candidates who came to the meeting, how many of them have already said they're running? I, actually, I would say probably 80% of them. See, that's what Jennifer did, and Jennifer's going to be on in the next segment. She, the day of the election, she was already committed to running. I mean, she put that out there. Um, the incumbent that she lost by 33 votes chose not to run the right. next time because Jennifer ran for two years before this election. And I do, I'm heartened to think that 80% of the women who showed up after many of them not winning. Right are ready to do it again. And after only a week. I mean, it was the week after the election. Actually, I should say, 
80% said they would run again, but everybody in the room committed to doing something in their community to stay involved. So, and also to help women leaders of Virginia as well. Everybody is committed. They raised $3.9 million collectively, garnered 170,000 votes. I mean, this is not a small No, this effort. is not a small change, and that's, no. not, that's not a small number of votes. And I, I think the other commitment that women candidates need to make is all those people who did come out and vote for them won another opportunity. They exactly. don't want this opportunity to simply go away and have it go back to the status quo. I mean, right now, I think it's 17% um, of our legislature's women. Right. And Kate brought that. Um, I think that's up from 13%. Jennifer probably added to that. But it's right. never been more than 18%. And right. that's in nearly 400 years. I think people yeah. have lost the significance of we can't break 18%, not on Capitol Hill, but not in Virginia. And we've been at it for 400 years. And I would also say, I think once we start electing more women, we will start talking about the real issues that face the state, which is economy, education, roads. We can stop talking about all the social issues that do nothing to move our state forward. I agree, because the, the greatest threat to women is economic equality, economic equality. It is opportunity for education. It's support for paid parental leave, maternity leave, right. which we do not have. These are, all of these get tied back to economics because women, and we have many single-headed households that are female-headed, right. and the, the issue is econom the economy, and the schools, and right. the roads, and the jobs, and equal pay. Exactly, and, and if we keep electing the same people, we're gonna keep having the same conversation. We have to get more women elected. 53% of our population is women. There's no way that we should not be also representing ourselves. Right, better represented. And Absolutely. so so I'm glad that we, we had you on so that we can make that distinction between the training aspect, which Emerge is doing, right. the fundraising membership, and we will be, as we move forward, we'll, we'll develop Women Leaders of Virginia PAC to be a resource where people cannot just go online to donate money, which right. obviously is very critical, Please but do. to figure out how to get other kinds of support for their campaign, other resources, you know, that is something that we're going to hopefully be as robust as some of the other programs we see in other states I in this agree. country. That is the goal. Well, I so appreciate coming all the way from Charlottesville. Well, thank um, you for having me. This is fantastic. And I, I do believe, from the first time I met you, I absolutely believed you could do this. There was never a thank doubt you. in my mind that you had started it, that you were going to see it through, and that it was going to be successful. I have that kind of confidence because I believe that Virginia is ready for this, it's been more than ready for this. I think the Women Leaders of Virginia is the how of how we get there. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Amy. Thank when we you, come Kevin. back, we are going to be talking with Jennifer Boisco, delegate-elect from the 86th District of Virginia, and talking with her about what it was that it took to get to victory this time around. So please join us after the break as we talk to Jennifer Boisco. So they say it's a man's world? I don't see anybody's name on it. While they were doing their thing, we slowly changed all that. Today, women can do anything men can do. And there's one thing we're even better at. Open enrollment is back. Enroll Virginia wants you to get covered for 2016 and beyond. You have until January 31st to enroll in affordable health care. If you wish to have coverage by January 1st, you must enroll by December 15th. That's less than a month from now. Remember, the penalty for not having health insurance next year is a minimum of $695 per person. Don't think twice about it. To find an enrollment event near you or to get free help with the application, visit our webpage or give us a call. El periodo de inscripción ha comenzado. Enroll Virginia quiere que tú y tu familia tengan cobertura médica este próximo 2016. Tienes hasta el 31 de enero para inscribirte. Si deseas cobertura desde el 1 de enero, debes inscribirte antes del 15 de diciembre. Recuerda que si no tienes cobertura el próximo año, te multarán una suma mínima de $695 por cada adulto. No lo pienses más y visita nuestra página para más información o para ayuda con la solicitud. <clears throat> hey, Hard, what's this? That's my resignation letter. You're resigning? Why? Because you're constantly ignoring me. You're half as active as you used to be, and you get stuff like this. You've been putting me under a lot of pressure lately. That's why I'm ready to quit. I, I forgot. I'll, I'll do better. 
Please, don't quit on me. Okay, but remember, it's not what you say, it's what you do. Listen to your heart. Don't let it quit on you. Let's go for a walk. Uncontrolled high blood pressure could lead to a stroke, heart attack, or death. Get yours to a healthy range before it's too late. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back. I'm Katherine Reed, your host for Inside Scoop Virginia. Joining me this evening is Jennifer Boisco, who is the delegate elect from the 86th District of Virginia, which is based in Herndon. Um, I'm so delighted to invite you back because two years ago in November of 2013, you were on the show with myself and Kathleen Murphy, and the two of you had just lost your election for the House of Delegates. That's right. So two years. Tell us how it's been from the night of I've made up my mind to run again mm -hmm. to the night you won. Gracious. And how long do we have to talk about that, Catherine? 13 minutes. <laughs> Well, you know, it's been a long road, but it's been it's been something that has been really enjoyable because because I was committed to running again. I've stayed at, very active in my community, which I've been for from two the decades because you work for Supervisor Faust, right? So and, and my, a lot of other capacities right, so as well. So my work in the community, my work with nonprofits, my work with volunteer groups, um, really helped me build my my uh, relationships and my network in town. I, I think that when I got into the race in twenty. 13, people didn't think I was a serious candidate. I was going up against an incumbent, an incumbent a, a who beloved, come, come, beloved, and former mayor of Herndon had, had been, you know, had done so much and, and, and he was seen as unbeatable. So people basically patted me on the head and said, Oh, aren't you cute? Good luck with that. You've heard me tell oh, that yeah. story before. Um, and, but, but I had a message. I think that's a big part of it is I had a real message talking about education, talking about transportation, talking about um, health care, making sure that we were talking about you know building the economy and people resonated with that. And when I went door to door to talk to voters, I was a listener and I, I made sure that I was t paying attention and, and being authentic. Um, doing that over the, the entire two years, so really I, I got started in 20, I started talking about running in 2012. So we're now at the end of 2013. Yeah. It's, it, 2015, it, it's been a, a really long time. Um, and you learn, you know, you, you, you learn that the message is, is connecting with other people and you, you grow more confident in what you're doing. And, um, and as you build relationships, other people decide that this is something worth their while as well. So it's not only a commitment from me and my family, which was enormous, but also from so many different groups of people who believed that I would be a good representative for my neighbor, my neighbors and, and friends and community. And, and so they were willing to invest financially and time-wise with their talents to help me get there. So it's not, it's not about me, it's about the community and the messaging as a whole that we really want to make our community a better place. And so I was very impressed because I've been involved with your campaign and mm -hmm. my husband Tom is yes. one of your number one, one of supporters. Number one. You know, people are like, do you think Jennifer's going to win? I'm like, my husband will be inconsolable if Jennifer does not win. <sighs> Seriously. So I was like, we were rooting for you. But let's talk about um, surrogates because when Frank Bleckman, I interviewed him and he, mm -hmm. that was something he brought up that I don't often hear is how candidates deploy surrogates or build coalitions or relationships of people in the community who do have respect and influence yeah. and a robust network, when you get those people on your side, mm -hmm. out there talking for you, I was really impressed with the commitment of Lisa Merkel yes. and Jen Baker mm -hmm. and Grace Wolf mm -hmm. and you know so many of the people in the Herndon Committee who have worked with you and known you, but they were willing to go out there publicly, stand on a soapbox and say, she is my candidate. Mm -hmm. How? critical is that piece? I think that is one of the most critical pieces because if you're doing it all by yourself and nobody is there with you, you're not going to get very far. Um, people have to, have, to, have to believe in what you're doing and they have to be willing to commit, you know, invest in, like what I was saying, invest in the campaign. Whether it's using their voice and their reputation to say, this is someone that I care about and I think is going to be the right person for us versus um, me just telling you I'm the right person. I mean, it's a difference between me having hubris and believing that 
I'm, I'm number one, as opposed to collectively we together agree that this is the right direction for the community. Um, and, and it was invaluable. And I'm so fortunate to have built those relationships over the years. I mean, this didn't happen overnight. Again, Lisa Merkel, our mayor, um, is my neighbor, and I have known her years. And we actually went to the same high school in um, Alabama, although we weren't there at the same time. Um, you know, Tom, but is the, is for this, instance. Is, the, is this a case, though, of rising tides lifting all boats in that mm -hmm. your mayor is the first woman, Lisa is the yes. first woman mayor of her She's actually not the first. My other neighbor, Carol Bruce, is the first okay, woman so mayor. She's the second one, but, yes. but she is overseeing a town council that is the first time majority women. Four women. Four amazing women. Yeah. Yes. So, so, so the more we see the bench develop, as mm -hmm. Kate alluded to, the mm -hmm. more you get people on the school board and the town council, mm -hmm. the women mayor, the more that you are and you so women support each other, whether you're running for the same office or a different office. That mm -hmm. was the other remarkable thing I, I saw emerge from this is that there are credible women in yes. the town of Herndon. There are. And they support each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that gives the people in the town a certain amount of confidence as to the ability and credibility, because I think that's very important when women run. Well, and they are, they are smart, capable people who you know are really making a difference. The, the town council that was in office before Ms. Merkel and Sheila Olam, Grace Wolf, and Jen Baker, as well as uh, you know the other, the other current members, they were focusing on issues that were, were rather divisive, I'll, I'll just say. Um, this new council has focused on metro redevelopment, economic development, making Herndon a place where people want to go, and celebrating the positive aspects of the town. Um, they are respected by the chamber. They're respected by the business owners. They're respected by the community leaders in the region. And that makes a big difference. And do people see you then as a team? And so you yeah. are the state representative mm -hmm. for this town. And these relationships yes. are hand in glove, collaborative mm -hmm. sorts of things. That you would assume that any community would see that as such a positive. Yeah, well, it, it's so much better when you can work together, right? We're all we're all better off when we can see each other's perspective, understand what's going to be best for everybody, and then move together um, to, to to implement those plans. I talked to Kate about how women possibly internalize certain kinds of issues or things that go wrong. More men have a tendency, in my uh, observation to just pick themselves up and go, well, it wasn't me. It's was probably somebody else. It probably <laughs> wasn't me. And they go on about their business. And women tend to, when things happen, sort of go, oh my God, it was it like, is. what did I do wrong? Mm -hmm. Or what, what did I do right? Or, you know, what could I have done differently or better? Because it must be me. But when Danny Vargas and the Republican supporters spent over a million dollars, that was one thing. You could even understand that. Mm -hmm. But when the Washington Post endorsed Danny Vargas, mm -hmm. exactly how'd that feel, Jennifer? Because <laughs> I can tell you, I'm not gonna tell you how I felt about it, but how'd you feel about it? Well, it was disappointing, but you know, I, I, I missed out on quite a few endorsements that are really um, movers and shakers and power, power sources. Um, I didn't let it stop me. I'm not, I'm gonna dance with the people who show up to my side. I'm gonna work with the folks who want me. And um, hopefully I will prove those who uh, didn't see the, you know, the, the, the message or my potential, they will, will see perhaps I was a good choice. Um, but I'm not going to lose any sleep over it, and I'm not going to hold any grudges. You Which know, we don't very, have time for that. Very wise counsel. And so what would you say to these 80% of the women Amy talked to who said, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to either run again or stay involved or do something? What is, what is best advice for how you keep going? Well, I think if you believe in what you're doing, if it, it really comes from a place of integrity that you know that you have something to offer, don't give up. Don't ever give up. Make sure that you're being smart about where you're spending your time and your energy. Um, continue to, to build bridges everywhere you can. Don't take anything personal because it can break you down really fast. Um, and, and, and always know that you can continue doing something better. This is really a tough business, and the elbows are sharp. It, you know, uh, you can't be, you can't be thin-skinned, and you can't um, believe what the naysayers are saying if you know in your heart you're doing this for the right reason. But you need to have that gut check and make sure that, that you really do believe in it, because it's too hard 
to put yourself through it if um, if you're just doing this to you know check something off your list, um, and and the consequences and the ability to make change are enormous. So it's it's a huge and humbling responsibility, um, and if you have that many people, you know because thousands of people are going to be depending on me now. About eighty-two, I believe I'll be representing eighty-two thousand people. That's a big responsibility. It's a big responsibility, um, but it's not about me. It's about it's about our community, and I do believe that women um, discount themselves and don't believe that they they have as much to bring to the table sometimes, and they should because we are half of the population. We're taking care of you know the majority of taking care of children and seeing. Uh, you know the difficulties that folks face that are outside the boardrooms because we're not in the boardrooms, right? Um, and and I believe it's just so important that we continue to to move forward and and to be resilient and tough and tenacious. I think the night of your victory party, and I was there for that. To see the people that were there, yeah. the young people, you had so many young yeah. people there, and the diversity of the people, you, old people, young people, longtime friends, new people. I when we when we went out door knocking, there were people who come from D.C. to door knock. I know. I mean, the outpouring yeah. of support was amazing. Yeah. I was the organizations who it came was. out and sent out volunteers. It there was. was such energy and such momentum, and in and of itself, that very process. Mm -hmm to me also created this amazing sense of community from the effort. Absolutely. So even though I'm sure it was exhausting, I can't even begin <laughs> to imagine how exhausting it was, but in the end, the process itself and the people who were brought together around your candidacy, mm -hmm. I think are there for the long term and will continue to be there for you. And I hope other women who run, if they don't win the first time, don't understand give up. that. Yeah, don't give up. And you, I mean, you're so right. The, the activity, the, the, the a actual effort of running for office was so amazing in itself without the win that I was so proud of the work that we did and what the community did and the folks who came to my side to, to be there with us. Um, I didn't know if I was going to win or not. I mean, with the onslaught of all of those ads and all the money that came in against me, I really was prepared to say, well, we tried and, and it didn't work, but you all were amazing because you gave so much of your time and your hearts and souls and blood and sweat and tears. Um, that's so powerful in itself. And I've been on the end of a losing race many times. I've, I, I've helped out on lots of campaigns where I felt passionately about. There's a lot to be said for just going through that process. Well, thank you for having gone through that project. Thank and you. congratulations, thank you delegate so much. elect. I am thrilled to, to be here to um, share this with you. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you so much for being here. We look forward to seeing you in Richmond, swearing in on the 13th. Yes. Absolutely. And thank you all for joining us. We appreciate you being here on Inside Scoop.